God is good and all the time. Our scriptures today are Luke 12, 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you. Then he said to them, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundance harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and there will be store for my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The title of our message this morning is Possessions. We continue our series through July and August in the Gospel of Luke. And remember again, we try to mention this each, each week, Luke is a physician, so he gives a prescription. So our prescription today is how to deal with possessions, not to take control of our lives. I'm going to be using one more time 
I've used it each of the Sundays in uh, July, the little blue book of grieving. One of our own, Elizabeth, um, wrote this when she was grieving the loss of her husband uh, with cancer. Uh, died a very young man. And, uh, but God always gives hope and gives tomorrow. And at the present time, and most of you know, Elizabeth, her and Rick uh, have gotten married. And uh, they are ministering in the foster care ministry right now and are going to be building a home to take care of these little children in honor of her uh, husband, previous husband that went on to heaven, and Rick's wife as well. It's going to call, be called the Jan Ron Home, and they're in process with that right now, but already uh, have a little one that they're taking care of, which is very precious. The little boy was here at the 8 o'clock service. So I'm going to use this one more time and uh, encourage you again, if you don't have that uh, uh, book that you uh, maybe consider that. It's a wonderful gift to give to somebody working through grief. I'm actually going to use that, Irene, for um, this week. We have our grieving class on the first and third Tuesday nights right before Bible study, and it'll be right here in our uh, chapel. And I'm going to read uh, a poem in a few moments out of that book, and then I'm going to dissect that for a few moments uh, with the group on this Tuesday night. Um, Possessions. We all have possessions that we enjoy. You know, when I was putting together the sermon, I was thinking back, even when I was very young, and I remember one of my chief possessions was my G.I. Joe. I remember that. And I, and I still have a couple of those G.I. Joes. I, I had the, the real hard head one, you know, the, the old days. And then uh, they went, they, one year they had a little bushy haired. Uh, G.I. Joe. I had one of those as well. I remember the last time I played with my G.I. Joes. I was up in Kentucky at the time, and uh, I remember out in the wooded area, but some bullies, you know, came in and just ruined it. They thought I was too old. I was only 19 at the time as I was playing with my... <laughs> so, I still have my G.I. Joes. Uh, my two little girls, you know, they, they're into Barbies, and so they found out about my G.I. Joe. So, you know, of course, Barbie has to have a, a guy, you know. And I said, just go over there to that sissy Ken doll. Just leave my, leave my, uh, my G.I. Joes alone, you know. We all have some kind of possession in our life. Um, sometimes it's, it's other humans. I, I remembered the story of Abraham and the son that God promised him. And when God gave him that son, he kind of idolized his son. He, uh, had, he really had a codependent relationship. That's an interesting term in psychology today. You're probably all familiar with that. He had that with his son. And so therefore, God says in the book of Genesis, Abraham, I want you now to take the son that I've given you, thy only son, and give him back to me. That's hard to do. And he struggled with that. It's a, it's a, pa a powerful story in Genesis. And it's a teaching story for all of us. We need to give our children our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews, back to God. You know, that's, it's difficult. The A of our ABCs today um, is an interesting passage that, that uh, Brother David read to us. It starts off by saying that the abundance, which is our A, the abundance of your possessions is not what measures a true man or woman of God. The abundance. But in our mind, it is. You know, if I've got these things, everybody else is going to really think I'm something special, you know. Um, the Bible tells us that we're to be married to God. You remember the Hebrew term, Beulah? Remember that great old southern gospel hymn, I'm longing for Beulah land? It means a land married to God. We're to be married to God, number one, even more important than even your spouse. Now, your spouse may not agree, but that is what... The scriptures teach to be the best spouse you can be, you need to make sure you are married to God. And what draws the attention of God is not your earthly possessions, but your trust in Him, your trust that He will take care of tomorrow. In uh, chapter 48, this will be the last one, as I mentioned, I'll use of, of Elizabeth's book. In chapter 48, it was very close to Ron dying. And uh, he was talking to Elizabeth about tomorrow. He said, you know, the Lord will take care of you. And she was writing about that, about struggling 
uh, wondering what tomorrow would bring. I'm sure all of us in one way or another have thought those thoughts. And she uh, quotes out of here uh, an old cartoon character um, or comic character, comic strip, uh, Orphan Annie. I know many of you are way too young for Orphan Annie, but they made a movie out of it. Uh, and Daddy Warbucks, uh, you know, little Orphan Annie, and, and they have redid it a couple times. But there's a song, if you remember in there, uh, that she sings. And if you know it, I'm going to do the chorus. I want you to sing it with me. The sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow. Come what may, tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you, tomorrow, you're only a day away. Well, I'll tell you, tomorrow is a, is a far way from some of us sometimes. We have enough trouble with today, you know, and that's what Elizabeth's dealing with And uh, Emily, her niece, wrote a poem for her, titled it tomorrow. I'm going to, this is what I'm going to share with the grieving class tomorrow and talk about it, or Tuesday night. Listen to this. This is powerful. Yesterday came and left, leaving my heart numb and deaf, as none could chase away the news I heard that day. Today I have survived, though I hardly feel alive. For never did I foresee losing such a part of me, yet life keeps going on, even though that part is gone. So I must find reason, hope for a better season, In tomorrow I find hope of a different kind, a reason to feel alive, to do more than just survive. You see, tomorrow won't stay, and it promises a new day, one which I have never seen, one which is beyond belief. And yet, of one thing I am sure, that tomorrow won't be a blur. For while giving rise to new, it can't erase the part of me that is you. Isn't that powerful? Emily uh, was here at our church a number of years ago for a while before she moved away and got married. And uh, just a beautiful young lady and has a wonderful family now, so close to Elizabeth. And she wrote that to try to help Elizabeth to work through Because tomorrow would come and it'd be a better day. And it is. Those of you that know Elizabeth. You know, the Lord has brought her and Rick together. And they have a tremendous love and family and ministry. Doesn't deny what both of them had with their previous marriages. But it gives hope for all of us that are struggling today. Some of you right in our room today, I'm sure, are struggling right now. And it may not be a loss of a loved one, but it may be a loss. You know? It may be a loss Maybe of possessions. And yet God says, I do not look at possessions. I look at the heart. Aren't you glad (laughs) that he looks at the heart? Now, in this conversation, the B of our ABCs, someone shouts out, Master, meaning Jesus, make my brother split our inheritance. And you can read between the lines. It doesn't sound like, please tell my brother. (laughs) It seems to be more like, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. And isn't it an interesting response, Jesus, who made me your judge? Now, I thought Jesus was the judge, right? You know, who put me the arbiter in your family situation? And I think what Jesus is saying very clearly is sometimes we got to work these things out, you and me. You and me, spouses, you you got to work it out. Brothers, sisters, church. Some of these things, you know. Jesus said, I've given you enough grace to work on it. So work on it. We have a tendency to want to go always back to the past. You know, ancient Israel, the forefathers, foremothers of our faith, authors of the Old Testament, they always would look back to Egypt. Remember, in Egypt, they were slaves. But when anything would get a little rough over here, they'd say, man, things were good way back there. We have a tendency to do that. We, we forget how the old days may have been, you know, when we're struggling today. And couples will do that in squabbles. They get going and finally somebody will bring up something from the past that should have been left buried a long time ago. Some of you are saying, I told you pastor was in our house this morning listening to us. 
You know you bring up, it's like you got this satchel of these things and, and when, you know, you don't plan on using them unless you have to. Unless you have to, because you keep it, you know. You ought to get rid of it, but no, I might need it someday, you know. And so when it gets heated, it's like, well, I'm just going to pull this one out. What do you, do you remember this? You know. Oh, my goodness gracious. My brother, tell him to do this, Jesus. Jesus said, no, you got to work. you got to work this out. You know, we're so full of greed sometimes and anger, you know, and frustration. Christians and non-Christians, let me say it that way. This just doesn't seem to matter, you know. The prodigal son story. Both those boys were prodigals. One had drifted away and one stayed home, but they were both prodigals from the father. Neither one of them understood the father. And the story is about the father, the love of God. And neither one, the one that stayed home and the one that drifted away, understood how much the father loved them. Isn't that interesting? Rivalry, struggles. They're always going on hand in hand. I love the story of Jacob and Esau in the Old Testament. You know, it ends up where Jacob is the good guy, but he starts off the bad guy. And so when he gets far away in a distant land, he loses everything. Okay? Everything. And when he comes back, all he has is his family. That's all he's got. And now Esau, who was the bad guy originally, now he's got 400 soldiers and wealthy. And so Jacob, the good guy, wrestles all night with God. And if you remember the story in the book of Genesis, the angel of the Lord finally said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to leave you, guy. And he's wrestling, and it's symbolical of prayer, and he will not let go. Don't let go of God. That's what the story's all about. And so the angel finally says, if you're going to hold on to me, it's going to be a rough ride. See, we're, we think we're promised this joy ride through earth. It's not. It's not a, you know it's not a joy, right? You know? We don't promise that. And so it ends up in that story, Jacob gets injured. And it appears that he's injured by God. Think of that. But God knows what's best. And it keeps him humble. And so when he comes to his brother, who happened to, used to be the bad guy, and so he thinks his brother's going to kill him, he, all he has is his family, and he comes up to his brother, and his brother forgives him. His brother forgives him. And he says, looking at you, brother, the one I thought hated me, was like looking into the eyes of God. Did that mean that the brothers then were bosom buddies? No. They lived on separate ends of town, I'm sure. You know? I mean, let's be real about that. But there was forgiveness. There was love. There was working together. There was compassion. That's what Christ is all about. So when the man looks at Jesus and says, tell my brother. Jesus said, you're not ready for me to tell your brother anything. He said, if anybody needs to be told something, it probably needs to be you. So you work this out. It's hard, isn't it? I remember being in a church and early morning prayer meeting and uh, we were talking and praying and and it, uh, one man <laughs> shouted out because he, he thought we were talking about his sister-in-law who was a leader in the church. And he said, I'll not forgive her. That's what he said right out, yelled it out. I'll not forgive her unless she comes on her hands and knees in front of me in this church. And I thought, whoa, there's some tension in this church. There's tension everywhere. Every, it's just that's life. What we, what we do with that is what matters. Now, the C, this is the best part. The C, Jesus always, I've said this every week in the, in the Dr. Luke's translation of the Bible. Jesus sees a situation and he says, let me tell you a story. <laughs> I love it, you know. I want, I want to tell you a story. And, of course, it's a parable. Remember, I mentioned this each week as well. A parable, you can break it apart in many different areas. But the parable, when it's called that, it means there's one main point. So don't miss the main point. There's a lot of tributaries, but don't miss the main point. So Jesus says, a rich man had a bumper crop. That's the C of our ABC, so you can remember this. Crop, a bumper crop. All right? Well, the people immediately are thinking, of course, if your theology of that day, if you're a rich man, you are godly, meaning that your possessions is what shows godliness, see? And Jesus said, well, wait a minute here. 
if you're rich, you're rich so that you can take care of the poor. It, God has blessed you, and you are responsible for others. You are your brother and sister's keeper. That's so important in the Christian faith, you know? Well, in the story, the man has a bumper crop, and he's looking around, and he says, you know what? I got it so good. He said, I think what I'm going to do is tear down my old barns and build new barns. And then I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. I'm just going to be a happy old goal. I'm just going to have a good old time, you know? Just, and, and God says, you know, what about your soul? He said, who's going to take all of this wealth that you're going to spend just on yourself? Who's going to take care of all this when you're gone? Because you're going to be gone tonight. Oh, my lands. Oh, my lands. You know, we're so full so many times of, of greed and, and just selfishness. You know, take it self-preservation. I think about the cross, the thief on the cross next to Jesus. And I, I think about the man crying out to Jesus and he said, Rememberest thou me when you enter your kingdom? And Jesus, what did he say back to him? Did he say, I, I remember you today, but do you remember yesterday? <laughs> you remember why you're on this cross? Give me the eyes of Jesus. Remember our opening song? Yeah. Now, life is muddy. There are consequences in life. We all know that. That's just part of, of our journey, whether it's family, whether it's church, whether it's our country, whether it's the military, you know, protecting us, whatever it is, you know, you have to work through these things, but we got to keep the right perspective. We got to have the right goal. We have to have the right motivation to seek God and seek his wisdom. Possessions. When I was thinking of the sermon again in preparation, I, I thought about, I remember back when I was 18, 19 years old, I, I loved to go out and, uh, target practice. I know that guns are a big issue in today's government by a lot of people. I mean, you hear that on the news all the time, but I loved them just for target practicing, and they got stolen, and I'd saved up all my money to have my little guns for target practice, and uh, it just, my possessions were gone. It was terrible, and uh, so it took a whole year to save up again, cutting yards, grass, and mom and daddy helped me, and my sister, so I could Buy some more target practicing things. And I used to carve on them. I was a, a, a wood carver. I just loved it. And uh, they got stolen again. Again. And uh, the second time, they actually found them, but found out it was my friend that had stolen them. I remember at that age trying to understand possessions because this now was I remember talking to my friend afterwards you know why'd you do this you know why why you know he didn't have it he wanted it you know he wanted something possessions you know so everything was confiscated and we went up to the station and they we had to sign a paper everything they found so then when we went to pick it up about a month later that had to be there for evidence um there was a, a major thing missing and so we told the police chief that, you know, well, we signed this paper and said it was in the box. Um, it was actually, I'll tell you what it was. It was my, I had a John Wayne pistol. It wasn't in the box anymore. He said it was, we signed for it. And he said, no, no, that was a misunderstanding. It wasn't in the box. Daddy didn't trust anybody. I just said, oh, well, okay. Daddy said, no. He said, we signed for it. It was in the box. He said, no, no, no. He said, it just, he said, it must have been a misunderstanding. And daddy would not let it go. So the police chief, he said, uh, well, let me go back and check again. And when he came back out, he said, you know what? He said, I don't know how we didn't see it, but it was. And I remember, again, 18 years old, 18, 19, somewhere there, thinking, who do I trust? Why in the world? You know, I can't trust my friend. And I'm not sure I can trust my police chief. Who do you trust? Possessions will send you to hell. <laughs> oh my gosh. They just they get a hold of us. People take things that they shouldn't take. 
And Jesus uses this concept to say, you have so many possessions you think are yours. He said, but the only thing that's going to last forever and ever and ever is what I have given you, and that's your soul. And is your soul right with me? And so I'm going to ask you the question Jesus asked. If your soul was required of you tonight, are you ready to go meet the Lord? And it might be. Think of this now. We might be doing your memorial service next weekend. We might. Are you ready to meet the Lord? We don't know what tomorrow will bring. But Jesus said, I'm right here. And I love you. And I want to come into your heart. And I want to fill you with good things. Eternal things. Blessed things. Are you ready? I want you to bow your heads with me in closing. Friends, I want you to take that seriously. Are you ready? I talked with an older gentleman the other day. And he said, I don't know. I don't know. Well, you need to know. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. You don't even know what's going to happen when you walk out those front doors. This isn't just for the older folks either, you young people. I can't tell you growing up how many funerals that I have participated and led in being a pastor for so many years of young people. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. But I do know that we have a soul. And I know that we have a wonderful, loving God. And I know that He has given His all for all of us. But He's a perfect gentleman. And He says the only possession that matters is your soul. Dear friends, can you place it in God's hands? If you've never done that, do it with me right now. Just say in your own heart, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Remember me. Come into my heart. I believe you died just for me. Come on, Jesus. Help me. I'm struggling with my brother, struggling with my sister, struggling with my spouse, struggling with my country, struggling with my church, struggling with my children, my parents, whatever it is. God, help me. Come into my life and help me. And I guarantee you he will. He loves you so much, church. Possessions. What's important? The only possession you'll take with you to the other side is your eternal soul. Just give it to God once again. Give it to God. Amen. Amen, 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 amen.